Where does your favorite NFL team rank after week six of the 2024 NFL season? What's going on, football fans? It's Mitch here, back with another week of NFL Power Rankings on the BLV. Each and every Tuesday, I rank every NFL team from the worst to the best. From number 32 to number one. Not only do we have a fresh week of NFL to discuss, the weaknesses, the strengths, and the storylines of week six, but we also have some trades that happened. I discussed Devontae Adams. I discussed Amari Cooper earlier today. Go check out that video that I made previously. If you haven't already, if you want to know my thoughts on the Jets and the Bills acquiring two big-time wide receivers for the AFC East Clash and Race. Grunt, spike the like button. Don't forget to subscribe. And let me know in the comments if you think my power rankings are accurate or trash. Let's get started with the worst team in the NFL, where I give you my honest opinion on your team. You're not going to find power rankings like this, where I will literally rip into every single team in the NFL. I do not care, bro. So let's begin with my team, because they absolutely blow. The Patriots suck. And they're my favorite team, but I don't care, man. But you know what I got to say? I got to say that it's going to be May because Drake May has finally arrived in the NFL. And boy, did he show those flashes. Exactly what I wanted to see. He's already on pace to becoming better than Tua. That's right, Dolphins fans. Ha! I got you there. Drake May... Man, the arm, it's live. The legs, he can scoot. And he showed some great nuance in his game. I thought his ability to progress through reads, I thought his ability to work the pocket and manipulate against pressure, I thought his ability to throw the ball deep, something that we've seen other rookie quarterbacks maybe struggle with. Drake May looks good. And I just wonder, why did the Patriots not start this kid in week one, because I think they'd probably be three and three right now. They probably would have beat the Seahawks. They probably wouldn't have lost to the Seahawks by a field goal, right? In overtime, they probably would have beat the Dolphins. I mean, they probably should have beat them anyways, if Jalen Polk has his feet the right direction, but regardless, they probably would have beat them. So we're talking about the Patriots, a team that's the worst in football, a team that's stupidly bad. I mean, the O-line is absolutely atrocious. I mean, most NFL fans probably don't know like who some of these guys are or have never even heard of them at the college level, at the NFL level. It doesn't matter. Bro, these guys stank, okay? And Drake May is having to overcome that. Drake May was the first rookie quarterback since 1950, maybe ever, to throw for three touchdowns and lead his team in rushing in his debut. Drake May is the man. But the rest of the team, I'm not playing, bro. They stink. Demario Douglas, okay, I like you. You can get open. You can make some plays. Hunter Henry, you're not so bad. Mondre didn't even play, bro. So we didn't even have Ramondre Stevenson. And Drake May still out there making these receivers look good. Jalen Polk can't catch. He's terrible. Cut him already. He's done. Austin Hooper might as well cut him at halftime. I mean, the guy might as well pull a Vontae Davis. He fumbled once, and then he was responsible or partly responsible for the interception for Drake May or one of them. Yeah, May, he did spray the ball a little bit. He missed a couple targets every once in a while. He did throw a bad interception when the jitters were too much early in the game. But this was against a defense that didn't allow a 200-yard passer all season until they faced Drake May. This was a defense that made Josh Allen look like a bum. And this was a Texan team that's pretty darn good. And they got Joe Mixon back. The Patriots failed to stop the run. No Nico Collins. Stephon Diggs and Tank Dell stepped up for them. 
And they made the Patriots' defense look very, 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 very bad slash mediocre. But honestly, when you dive a little bit deeper, I thought the Patriots' defense played better in the second half outside of a couple of explosive runs. And I did feel like, honestly, I'm disappointed by the defense. I'm disappointed that they're not able to carry this team the way they did last year. Because I felt like if the team and the defense that we had last year was mixed with the quarterback we have now, I think that would be a relevant wild card chasing type of team. Maybe I'm crazy. But even with the deficiencies on the O-line, if this defense was where expectations were, and I understand Jawan Bentley's hurt and Jabril Pepper's in trouble with the law and Christian Barmore has some off-the-field health dilemmas. I mean, I get that major players are out here, but... Gerard Mayo's unit is not stepping up to the plate, and that really underlines and exclamation points, and I promise NFL fans out there that are not Patriots fans, I'm almost done about this team, okay? I don't know if Gerard Mayo is the answer. I don't know how we will know that yet, and I like Gerard Mayo. I hope he's the answer. He's a former Patriot player. I'd rather that be the answer. But you have to wonder, why did Robert Kraft not interview Mike Vrabel? I'm just, I'm just throwing that out there because he's also a former Patriot legend and he's already been a proven NFL coach. And I do wonder if Mayo does not work out. Would that be the next guy in line? I hope so. But offensively, Alex Van Pelt also definitely raising some questions about his play calling, about just the layers of the offense, the, the route combinations, the spacing of the offense the underutilization of play action. I don't think it's a disaster, but I don't think it's where it should be. And I just don't see the edge from the coaching that I've seen in years past under Belichick. That was obviously going to happen, but I just am underwhelmed by the coaches, bro. So at number 32, the New England Patriots. At number 31, the Carolina Panthers. Man, when I watch the Panthers, I just, like, I shake my head, bro. And I just say, can this team stop anybody? I'm watching this team, and I'm like, can they stop a single soul? It is actually hurting my noggin to watch this team on defense. Like, run the ball, throw the ball, pass rush, run defense. It doesn't, bro, it doesn't matter what you do. The Panthers are so bad on defense. That you could literally do whatever you want. You could run the Lions offensive line throw trick play playbook and probably score 40 on the Panthers. I mean, they are that bad on defense. They have no pass rush. Their run defense is pathetic. They can barely cover. Like, wow, this is bad. And then on the other side, we've got jabronis, jamokes, absolute idiots on X saying, oh, you should play Bryce Young. Are you an idiot? Like, do you watch football? Why would you play Bryce Young? First of all, if you play Bryce Young, his trade value is going to go down. I swear, Dan Orlovsky must be being paid by these agents of terrible quarterbacks. I'm not going to lie. He did the same thing with Mac Diddley Jones. Now, at least Mac Diddley is a little bit better than Bryce Young. But now he's got Bryce Young? He's defending Bryce Young? Have you seen this guy play? Like, he's in the same conversation as Jamarcus Russell. Guys, search up on YouTube. Jamarcus Russell sacks himself. This was a real play. This guy, Bryce Young, is in the same conversation as a quarterback that sacked himself. Think about that for a single second, okay? You don't want that on your field. Why? It makes everybody look bad. It makes the owner look bad. He's already very emotional, as we know. It makes the receivers look bad. Deontay Johnson might quit in the first quarter, not even wait for halftime. It's going to make your investment at running back look bad in Brooks when he returns, even though Chuba Hubbard, Team Canada, looking pretty good. It's going to make... Your O-line that you invested money into look bad because he's running around in circles getting sacked. It's going to make small people and short kings across the world feel bad that this young man is so bad at football. 
Why would you play Bryce Young? Andy Dalton is actually a decent NFL quarterback. Just because the defense can't stop anything, you shouldn't put that on Andy Dalton. I mean, look at the results. At least the Panthers are watchable now. At least on offense, they score. At least you can see if Leggett is good or not. With Bryce Young, you get seven points a game. Like, it is not watchable, not playable, not doable. Shove it up your rear end. Don't, don't tweet that. At number 30, the Las Vegas Raiders. I got to say this. Antonio Pierce is, I know that Raiders fans like him for some reason. I don't get what it is. Because, bro, I remember last year, the year before that, you guys were saying, oh, Josh McDaniels is the problem. Josh McDaniels is the problem. You guys just fed off the media's bull crap, bro. Now, all of a sudden, you've got a borderline cheerleader, you know, jumping up and down. Oh, yippee. I'm Antonio Pierce. I played for the Giants. I beat the Tom Brady Patriots in 07. But congratulations, pal. Like, what do you do? You're worse than Nick Sirianni. You punt the ball. At least Nick Sirianni goes for it. You punt the ball on the 41-yard line of the other team down seven. Like, what do you do? You don't even ask Marvin Lewis, a former NFL head coach who's right beside you, what you should be doing. You just, you just go about your ways. You should be a high school coach, but maybe not even high school. Maybe like semi-pro or some shit. What do you do? You suck. Get rid of him. Max Crosby. Stud. He's the only thing this team's got left. Devontae Adams asked for a trade after two games. He's gone. See you, Devontae Adams. Malcolm Kuntz is hurt. Christian Wilkins is hurt. Jack Jones doesn't want to tackle. Uh, Jacoby Myers is hurt. The O-line is hurt. Aiden O'Connell's got an ugly mustache. And Zamir White can't get through one yard of the offensive line because they can't block anybody. Brock Bowers is literally the only saving grace of the entire season, and he's a tight end. Like, bro, what are we doing here? Get rid of Antonio Pierce. He is terrible. How can we sit here and blame Josh McDaniels, and then we don't blame Antonio Pierce, who brings nothing to the table? At least McDaniels called the plays. What does Pierce do? Just, like, mean mug on the side? Like, what does he do? At number 29, oh my goodness, the Jacksonville Jags. If I have to sit here and scroll through X one more time and see Jag fans or film bros or Benjamin whatever his name is at ESPN, bro, if you tell me one more time that Trevor Lawrence is somehow not terrible, I will rip my entire hair out, send it to you, and make you eat it. Like, what are you talking about? The guy is so bad. Can we just, like, can we stop? I don't know where these guys are getting paid, how much these guys are getting paid. Trevor Lawrence sucks. He's bad. Like, can we admit it yet? Please. The offensive line is not good. But, dude. Drake May is already better than Trevor Lawrence. They're going to play in London, and Drake May is going to have Demario Douglas and J Jalen Polk and half a, a, a shell of himself, Kendrick Bourne. And he's probably going to play better than Trevor Lawrence, who has Brian Thomas, a human Mustang, at wide receiver. Evan Ingram, who, yes, fumbles, but is half decent. Christian Kirk, who's actually pretty good, and Gabe Davis, who is absolutely horrible, but that's besides the point. And he's going to have Tank Bigsby and Travis Etienne. And Drake May. Drake May is going to have Jamichael Hasty, who couldn't even make Jacksonville's roster. And he's probably going to look better than this guy. And you got Doug Peterson, a Super Bowl coach, looking like he is a bum. Trevor Lawrence is making a Super Bowl coach, Doug Peterson, look like a bum. And Doug Peterson, please, I beg you, go for it against the Patriots at your own 35-yard line on fourth and two. Please go for it. 
on fourth and two at your own 35-yard line. Meanwhile, the Jags corners can't cover anybody. Does anybody notice this? Like, they can't cover at all. Like, at all. And they're still playing cover one. I think they're playing. They're still playing cover one. They're not even playing right now. I think Darnell Savage is still playing cover one, bro. Like, what are they doing? So, Jacksonville is really, really bad. For me to have a team this bad at number 29 speaks volumes about the NFL, about how bad the NFL is. Number 29 on my list is the Jacksonville Jags. Are you serious? Wow, that is horrible. At number 28, the Cleveland Browns. Oh my goodness. I actually had another. I don't know. I don't remember your guys' name sometimes. I'm sorry, dude. You just all fall into the same section of jabronis. What are you doing? How can you comment on my videos? Deshaun Watson is not the problem. Are you out of your mind? Do you need to go to a doctor? I think we should get you checked. I mean, I know there are free clinics out there because you need to go get checked for your eyesight. I'm pretty sure you can go uh, to a, an eye center out there. Like, get your eyes checked, please. Holy crow. Are you serious? What did he do to you? Did he diddy you? What did he do? Why are you defending Deshaun Watson? Did he blackmail you? Like, what happened? Why? Why are you commenting on my videos? The O-line is so bad that no quarterback could play behind this O-line. Are you serious? I just saw Drake May throw three touchdowns and 260 yards and put up 21 points against the Texans' defense with some guy that's never played tackle in his entire life. He's, he's a guard. His name is Zach Thomas. I thought they were trolling me. His name's Zach Thomas, the linebacker of the Miami Dolphins, is playing left tackle for the Patriots. And you're going to sit here and say Deshaun Watson is not the problem when he has Amari Cooper and David Njoku and Kevin Stefanski? And I'm watching a rookie in his first start with Zach Thomas and some random guy they picked up off the Raider practice squad playing center? And they're scoring 21 points and the Browns, their only touchdown is from a kick what, a field goal block return? Like, are you kidding? Stop. I'm going to block you. Please do not send me these comments. They literally make me angry. Just please stop. The Browns are embarrassing. Kevin Stefanski, pull up your pants, dude. Gosh. Such a... Number 27. The Miami Dolphins. Miami Dolphins. I'm going to admit, I didn't think, I never thought I would be actually hoping to watch Tua. That is how bad the Miami Dolphins are that I am sitting here on my hands and knees. Praying that Tua Tagovailoa actually suit up for an NFL game. His clunky ass. His no arm strength having ass. I got to watch Snoo Puntley. You got to watch Snoo Puntley. I mean, really? Now, Mike McDaniels had a bye week. They should be able to run the ball. Teron Armstead is back. You still got Tyreek. I think he's still on the team. Anybody check? Cheetah, please show up. Jalen Waddle, the Penguin himself. Best TV show on television, by the way. Uh... He is still there, I think. Anyone check? Let me know in the comments if Jalen Waddell and Tyreek Hill are still on the Dolphins. I'd like to clarify that. Defensively, they're not horrible. They're fine. They're okay. But they've lost plenty of pieces up front on the D-line. 
I think the Dolphins are still potentially a wild card threat if Tua comes back relatively quickly because the AFC as a whole is junk. The NFL is junk. The Dolphins are what, two and three? They still got a chance. I'll give them a little bit. That's why they're at number 27. But man, this team's ass. Next, at number 26, my goodness. How is Will Levis's team number 26 on my power rankings? I have no idea. At least the Titans have a defense. They could have beaten Joe Flacco, which is a feat in its in its own right. I mean, beating Joe Flacco in today's NFL is pretty hard to do, to be honest. I will say that they didn't win because Will Levis is ass. And there's still people on X that are going to grade him like he is some miraculously great downfield passer or something. And he's being held back by his offensive line and his play caller. Like, if you cannot see with your own two eyes that Will Levis is a piece of monkey crap, I do not know what to tell you. Like, he is so bad. He is a turnover waiting to happen. And not only that, but he's the first NFL quarterback in the history of quarterbacks to be not only a turnover waiting to happen, but literally a real-life walking meme. He is a walking, breathing, living meme on the NFL field. He is so bad that his actions lead to memes. His O-line is pretty bad. Tony Pollard is pretty good. Calvin Ridley, do you still exist? DeAndre Hopkins, I feel sorry for you, sir. Come to the Patriots. You should assign with the Patriots. And defensively, they're good. Jeff Simmons, someone save him. You know what? I feel like Jeff Simmons is like that. You know that meme where the guy's trying to save the dog? I think it's a dog, right? He's trying to save the dog in the pet store, and he's next to the, the glass, and he's, he's knocking on the glass. That's Jeff Simmons. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. The Titans suck, dude. Because Will Levis is bad. I actually don't think this team is that bad. I just think Will Levis is a walking meme. At number, I don't want to talk about them again. At number 25, the Indianapolis Colts. My problem with the Colts is that they are going to play their worst quarterback. Anthony Richardson will be playing this week, I believe, which is a total and utter mistake. Anthony Richardson is not good. He's not good. I mean, Joe Flacco makes Josh Downs look like the next coming of Steve Smith. Alec Pierce look like Jordy Nelson. And Michael Pittman with half a hamstring look like his father. I mean, what are we talking about here? How is Joe Flacco not the quarterback? Also, Trey Sermon sucks. Like, he is really bad. The defense is horrible, and they still held. This is how bad Will Levis is that the Colts' defense held the Titans to 17 points. That's how bad Will Levis is. The Colts' defense sucks. They're horrible. I heard, uh, you know, Womack is being really highly graded by PFF, if anybody cares. The D-line, eh. Defense, Gus Bradley, the Colts, they're 3-3. Three and three. I don't know how. I guess Joe Flacco, but they, they play like a really difficult schedule coming up. They're going to lose like every game. They're going to lose like every game. I can't wait to bet against this, this team. They're horrible. They're way more interesting with Joe Flacco. Next up, at number 24, at least a watchable football team, the Arizona Cardinals. The Cardinals just, okay, so this is my problem, right? The Cardinals had to maximize their September and early October window because soon a game called Call of Duty comes out. And once that game comes out, Kyler Murray will not be seen. He will not be heard from. He will be like Johnny Manziel studying tape. Zero. The defense, horrible. Can't stop the run. They just put Bilal Nichols on the IR. Good luck. Uh, secondary can't stop anybody. Their defense is horrible. 
And here's my problem. You don't know if Jonathan Gannon is good or not because the defense is so lacking of personnel that how do you even put blame on this guy if his defense sucks? I mean, they've got like a practice squad as their defense. Their offense is supposed to be good, but Kyler Murray is like the most inconsistent player in the NFL. Their O-line's a bit beat up. Now James Conner all of a sudden is fumbling. Marvin Harrison's injured. I guess it means more Greg torched the Dorch, but I mean, other than Michael Wilson, is anybody playing well right now? I guess Trey McBride, but bro, the Cardinals are disappointing. They stink. They are terrible. How did they win two games already? How did they blow out the Rams? That's one of the weirdest games I can remember. This team sucks. What are we even talking about? Can we just get to good team? Are there any good teams? Nope. Number 23, the New Orleans Saints. Wow. Okay, this team's number 23. They are awful. They just allowed 600 yards in an NFL game. 600. What? 51 points? Are you kidding me? They couldn't tackle Chris Godwin. They couldn't tackle some guy named Sean Tucker. They couldn't tackle Bucky Irving. The only thing the Saints do well is cover Mike Evans. That's literally it. Do they do anything else? Dennis Allen's going to be fired. Derek Carr is going to be canned. He's injured right now. Look at this team entering Thursday night. And I'm not really factoring this in too much. It's a short week, whatever. We'll move forward. If this team was actually being evaluated like right now based on their current situation, they'd probably be 32. I'm not going to lie. They've got Spencer Rattler at quarterback. They've got like three O-linemen out. Chris Olave and Rashid Shahid are both done. Uh, like Olave's got a conky and Shahid's got a broken knee apparently. And the defense is terrible. So yeah, I mean, what Chase Young's still chasing Mahomes. I saw him the other day. He was running. He's still chasing him. He's so slow. My goodness. At number 22, the Los Angeles Rams. This is like the first team that I can actually like say that they have maybe a little bit of hope. The Rams do get Cooper Cup back, who is currently one of the greatest uh, vanilla wide receivers in football. And, you know, it's a pleasure to watch Cooper Cup. He's a good route runner. He separates. He gets open. He's everything that Jalen Polk is not. And uh, I wish we had somebody like him on the Patriots, but unfortunately we do not. The O-line is still Terrible. The running back is good. Kyron Williams is a guarantee to score a touchdown in every game. Matthew Stafford is still Matthew Stafford. Giants fans wanted to have the Giants trade for Matthew Stafford. That came out of nowhere. I don't know where that came from. The receiver, I want Puka to come back because then this offense becomes pretty darn fun. I mean, even their backup receivers are like pretty good. Like Tutu Atwell, Whittington, uh, Demarcus Robinson. I mean, that's probably as good as the Patriots receivers. I'm not even going to lie about that. Sean McVay. I don't know, man. He's winning at life. So like, I can't really complain about him. The defense is pretty bad. They can't stop the run. They can't stop the pass. I don't really know what they do very well. Who would have thought it's, you know, it's not like I told the Rams fans that were commenting that they were going to win the division, that they don't have a defense. Hopefully they figured that out by now. But I will say, if this offense can get back to health, I think they can maybe sneak up on some people and be pretty feisty. I just don't think they have the well-rounded team and they've already started off pretty rough that they're not going to make the playoffs. At number 22. At number 21. Oh my gosh. The Denver Broncos. How is the NFL so bad that we have Bo Nix's football team? Yes, Jake Hedge. Bo Nix's football team being ranked number 21. That's 11 spots into our list. We've got Bo Nix, the, the man that runs in circles more than any other quarterback I've ever seen and just throws the ball wildly. He has absolutely no idea what he's looking at in a consistent basis. What is this offense? It's like a bunch of screen passes, a bunch of runs, and then Bo Nix running around and just throwing random passes. Like, what is... What type of Sean Payton offense is this? And then you've got the defense that's actually kind of good. 
The pass rush is pretty fun. They've got a bunch of dudes. Zach Allen, Benito, Cooper. Uh, shout out to the defense. The safeties have been overperforming. Riley Moss is actually good. And he's white playing corner. Who would have thought? I can say that. I'm also vanilla. And you've got a defense that's good somehow. You've got an offense that sucks. But somehow they win some of their games. This team doesn't really make any sense. They've got some voodoo magic. Somehow they, they somehow allowed the Saints to injure their entire offense before they played them so that they would win this game. If the Broncos make the playoffs, I am going to officially quit the NFL. I just, I don't know how I would watch that game. Somehow the NFL is going to line it up so that the the 9 and 8 Broncos who have a point differential of minus 150 are going to play the Chiefs in the wild card round as a a borderline bye week and they're going to have uh Carson Wentz playing by the third quarter and it's going to be 38 to 3. So, I can't wait to see this Broncos team on Thursday night. They are so boring. At number 20, the New York Giants. The Giants, I think, are actually kind of sneaky decent. But now Andrew Thomas got hurt. That is a backbreaker. That sucks. That absolutely blows, bro. Andrew Thomas got hurt. Now Daniel Jones is going to turn into a human tent. He's just going to fold up. And then you've got Malik Neighbors and Wandell Robinson, who are pretty darn good together. I think Brian Dayball has been coaching his behind off. I think this front seven's been playing excellent football lately, especially against the Bengals. I thought the Giants were borderline the better team against the Bengals. I thought they were borderline the better team. Uh, Tracy is a stud. Love that kid. I actually like the Giants. I like Darius Slayton. Daniel Jones isn't that bad, but now that they have Andrew Thomas out, they're screwed. Because Daniel Jones is going to start panicking and throwing the ball up. So, I actually thought this team looked promising, but now I might have to move them back. At number 19, oh my goodness, the Dallas Cowboys. This team rather wins an ugly game or gets slaughtered. There is no in-between. The Dallas Cowboys are pretty much Dak Prescott and CeeDee Lamb, and that's it. What else do they have? The O-line is inconsistent. The run game is non-existent. The defense... Gosh. Mike Zimmer has had a tough time out there this year. The D-line is just a bunch of pussies. The secondary, I mean, Trayvon Diggs looks slow. Deron Bland's coming back, but we'll give him some time. I think Donovan Wilson plays hard, but there's not a lot I can say about this defense. Jordan Lewis isn't too bad. They need Parsons back. They need Lawrence back. This team is going nowhere. They are bad. They should be selling players. Like, honestly. Like, wow. Dak just makes one or two really stupid first-half mistakes that ultimately hurt his team in the end. They can't control a game because they can't stop the run. They can't run the ball. They're just charm and soft, bro. This Cowboys team is charm and soft. They they need helicopters helicopters to get to practice. At number 18, the Seattle Shithawks, I mean the Seahawks are at number 18. The Seahawks can't stop anything right now. What is going on with my my king? My man, my prince, Mike McDonald. Bro, wake up. Your defense sucks. Roy Robertson Harris was acquired by Seattle this week. A savvy under-the-radar trade. Just like Cam Akers to the Vikings. That was random. I thought they hated that guy. But regardless, Roy Robertson Harris is actually a good football player. Now, that being said, you have about 17 defensive tackles. Maybe you need something else on your team. Have you guys ever thought about maybe getting a D-end? or a safety, or a corner, or a linebacker, or any other position. 
Because I understand that Byron Murphy's hurt. But you've got like 18 D tackles. You, you got so many D tackles, you're playing them at DN. Like Draymond Jones has been playing DN. Like what are we doing? Seattle. I actually like watching Seattle because Geno is a lot of fun. I just aesthetically am pleased by how he throws the ball. I think that he is no fear and he rips it, even if it's going to be picked off by a rookie on San Francisco, most likely. DK Metcalf throws a fit every week or he scores like an 80-yard ridiculous touchdown. Tyler Lockett makes some of the dumbest catches you've ever seen in your life. Jackson Smith and Jigba is the master of catching two-yard passes and making them seven-yard gains. Kenneth Walker is the master of taking negative runs into three-yard carries. And the O-line is terrible, so it makes for a lot of backyard football. The offense is suspect from a play-calling standpoint. I do wonder why they ran the ball so much against the Niners. I was, of course, at the game, and it feels like a lifetime ago already. But I still, I still somewhat believe in Seattle. I'm just worried about the state of the O-line and the defense. I think the defense, once they get healthier, they will be better and they'll sneak up on some people, but I'm not very confident. I'm not very confident. And this O-line doesn't give me much confidence in the, in the consistency of the passing game either. So at, at number 18, Seattle. At number 17, the Chicago Bears. The Bears. Uh, now everybody is saying, like, Caleb Williams is the greatest thing since sliced bread. Although, like, he just refuses to throw the ball deep now, and all he does is take completions, which, good on him. He's playing like Patrick Mahomes. So that's that's good. But I feel like the Bears are not getting credit where they should be getting credit. Like, their defense is the reason they're a competent football team. The defense is legitimately very good. The defense is good. Jalen Johnson shuts everybody down, bro. The D-line plays hard. They do give up some runs every once in a while. The linebackers are very, very talented. I love some players on this defense, man. I, I like how Matt Eberflus coaches it. And they're very consistent. They're very consistent. The O-line has been playing a bit better. Who would have thought, maybe when Caleb Williams doesn't run around in circles 20 yards behind the line of scrimmage, that the O-line would maybe play a little bit better. Keenan Allen looks back, not fat anymore. He probably, you know, went on the the no more ice cream diet like Patrick Mahomes. And the wide receiver play like DJ Moore is a stud, although he didn't do too much in London. I thought it was a very impressive second half performance by Chicago. First half was a little shaky. A little shaky, little rust, a little uh, maybe time zone change. But Jacksonville's awful. I thought that was a good matchup for them because Jacksonville's O-line is awful. They're their pass defense is awful, so I thought Caleb could succeed. He did four passing touchdowns, I think five total touchdowns. He showcased his athleticism, his quickness, his release, and Keenan Allen made a couple big touchdowns. Cole Komet, a couple big touchdowns. Some good play calling in the game by Shane Waldron. It's about time. And DeAndre Swift in the run game has been a lot better, which has also been a con contributing factor. So I think the biggest thing that's turned this team into – a pretty interesting wildcard contender is the the run game, the O-line, Caleb's just consistency in terms of taking completions. You know, D-line, O-line, run game, consistency in completions. So Chicago's talented. We know this. Like, like there's a reason people pick them to make the playoffs, like me. At number 16, <laughs> Chargers. They bolted up against the Broncos off the bye week, and they dominated. They were up 23 to nothing at one point, and Justin Herbert finally looked like Justin Herbert. Finally. They were like 11 for 18 on third down, which is classic Justin Herbert Charger football. Lad McConkey is a player. J.K. Dobbins, also a player. O-line overcoming some injuries pretty well. Herbert, Again, looks a little bit more fluid, looks a little bit more confident. Maybe he's settling into the offense. Greg Roman seemed to have some good play calls in the first half. And defensively, I think they're actually legitimately solid. I'm not going to say they're great, but they're well-coordinated. I think that they mix in different pass rush. They're really good against the run right now. And they've got guys at that second and third level that just fly to the football. They are not scared. Like Derwin James and Denzel Perryman, they're going to knock your socks off, bros. 
So I think Asante Samuel might be hurt. That's a problem. They've got a major game on the road at Arizona Monday Night Football. That's not going to be an easy game to win, despite what I said about the Cardinals, because it's on the road on Monday night. If the, Car if the Chargers can win that, I think they can pretty much prove to us that they're better than the bad teams in the league, and they can be playoff competent. So we'll see with the Chargers. At number 15, pretty much the same sort of team as the Chargers. Worst quarterback, but better overall roster and defense, the Pittsburgh Steelers. Steelers have decided to roll with Russell Wilson over Justin Fields, which some people got all in their panties in a bunch because of it. And I just want to say, bro, did you guys watch the Steelers? Like, I'm curious. Does anyone actually watch the Steelers? Because as somebody that consistently, for some reason, bets on Mike Tomlin's voodoo, to come through and cover my bets, which somehow they did against the Raiders. Justin Fields, borderline awful the last two games. Like, as a passer, awful. Can't see the field, can't make proper throws, can't go through progressions. Like he's, It's like he's blind, bro. I swear. Russell Wilson, at least he has eyes. He can make a deep ball throw. He can make a moon shot. He can make some crazy plays, you know, with his quickness and with his arm and outside the pocket. I think he'll be more dangerous for this offense in ad-lib situations. The run game for the Steelers has looked better as of late, and I think that's huge for them. The Raiders game was Najee's best game I've seen him play in a while. The defense is very good, but I don't think it's, like, dominant. TJ is a monster. Cam Hayward's playing really well. Porter's playing well. Queen played better this past game. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. The Steelers, I feel like Steelers fans are a bit delusional. Like, they think this team is actually good. But they're just a competent, well-run team in an awful league. That's what they are. And that's why they're, they're in the mix. But if you expect this team to go any further than a first-round exit, you're losing your mind because their quarterback play is not good enough. And their offense isn't good enough. So at number 15, slightly above average Pittsburgh Steelers. At number 14, yes, a team that has two less wins and two more losses than the Pittsburgh Steelers, I believe. The Cincinnati Bengals. Because the Bengals have the much better quarterback, much better offense. And the defense showed up against the Giants and played pretty good football. I think that when they have Sheldon Rankins and B.J. Hill, that changes things for this team and for this, for this defense. It allows them to be beefier up the middle and helps them stop the run. I think their pass rush, B.J. Hill, was also very good in that regard in this past game. Trey Hendrickson is playing better as of late. Their secondary is still burnt toast, but uh, as long as they can get a better pass rush, they should be okay. And I think Big Lou will continue to make this defense better through scheme. The offense had a down game against the Giants, but Jamar Chase still made his plays. Yossi Voss made his plays. Joe Burrow running for a 40-yard touchdown was something I didn't have on my bingo card. Chase Brown continues to be the best running back on this team. Zach Moss fumbling, you know. Uh, yeah, T. Higgins is good. I think, I think the Bengals are going to go on a bit of a run here. Again, I've said it a few times. I think they're going to make it interesting in the AFC North against those Ravens. I think they're going to pick up a couple wins here, get to like 4-4, four 5-4, and four, five and, four, and I think they're probably going to end up as a wild card team that is dangerous, but a little flawed. That's that's kind of the, the way that they scream at me right now, but they still got a long way to go. They've got to be more consistent. And I'd like to see them just from start to finish dominate a lesser opponent. I don't think I've seen that yet. So at number 14, the Bengals have their issues, but they've also got their potential Burrow's playing like one of the best quarterbacks in the league. At number 13, I've got the New York Jets, who I could move higher, but their record is just what it is. Rodgers is weird because a lot of people seem to like be kind of berating him and like saying like he's playing terrible, but he's really not. Like, I've never watched the Jets this year, and I've never been sitting back and saying, oh, he's washed, he's cooked, he's bad. Like, I haven't said that once. I honestly think the Jets have been playing like on offense better than their defense. I think Rodgers, yeah, he did have three turnovers against the Vikings, but I didn't I wasn't sitting there like, oh, Rodgers was awful in this game. 
I think his accuracy, his arm strength, they're still there. His ability to read the field, still there. His ability even at times to get outside the pocket and make throws. I mean, that Hail Mary was spectacular. He made some deadly throws in that game against the Buffalo Bills. Brees Hall and Braylon Allen are an awesome combo, and Brees had his best game of the season. I like the play calling against Buffalo. I overall have not minded the play calling all year. Um, they've got good balance. Now they bring in Devontae Adams, another A-class weapon to complement Garrett Wilson and take pressure off Garrett Wilson. That's going to do wonders for this offense. That's going to change how defenses play them. They're going to have to play more too deep. They're going to have to you know, lessen the load against the run, which is going to allow the Jets to run the ball and control the game a bit better. The most disappointing thing about the Jets is their weird coach firing at a weird spot and then their defense that has been underwhelming all season long. If this defense can get to a top 10 level where they were expected to be, this could be a dark horse Super Bowl contender. I really believe that. They've dropped two close games against Buffalo and Minnesota, but they've shown extremely promising signs for the future of this team this year. Because ju let's just remember, Aaron Rodgers has only played about five games as a Jet. So at number 13, the, the Jets. At number 12, the Philadelphia Eagles, who I want to put the Jets above, but the Eagles have two more wins and two less losses. And it's hard to because of the Eagles' preseason expectation. And when you talk about their preseason expectation, they're pretty much in line with where you thought they would be right now. So it's fair enough. Jalen Hurts still has been disappointing and inconsistent. <sighs> A.J. Brown is a monster. Devontae Smith is very, very good. The O-line is awesome. But as Lane Johnson put it, it feels like the offense is constipated. Saquon Barkley should always be the featured element of this offense. But it feels like when they can't run the ball, they can't do much because they have no consistent precision passing game. Their entire passing game is based on wide receiver talent and big plays and explosives and Jalen Hurts outside the pocket. And that's it. Their defense is decent. I think it's a lot better than last year and where they ended things for sure with Vic Fangio there. But they do have their flaws. I think they're definitely susceptible at corner. They're definitely susceptible at linebacker. And their pass rush has been up and down all year. So at number 12, they looked good against the Browns defensively, but that's the Browns. At number 11, the Commanders. The Commanders, I actually thought they fared better against the Ravens than I thought would happen, like score-wise. They never really were in the game in terms of, oh, I felt like they were going to win. I never felt that way in the Commanders-Ravens game, but I also have to give them credit for hanging around the entire time and only losing the game by seven at home. That's something that Buffalo was not able to do earlier this year. I think the Washington Commanders are in trouble when it comes to Jonathan Allen being lost for the season. That hurts an already limited, bad defense with not a lot of playmakers. I do think what Dan Quinn has done with the defense in terms of playing more conservative coverage, I think in terms of Bending but not breaking. I think in terms of their run defense. I think in terms of all those things. The commander's defense has played better as of late. I would also say that Jaden Daniels, I thought had one of his best days in terms of his overall accuracy and ball placement and touch in the NFL. I thought he actually had to make some big boy throws in this Ravens game and was capable against pressure or not. The run game certainly missed Brian Robinson, but it feels like the Commanders will not be the high-octane, potent offense without the run game. And that's probably going to be their undoing because their defense can't really be exposed to long possessions or a lot of possessions. So the Commanders right now feel like a wild-card team that's fun, that's exciting, that started off really well, but will probably fade down the stretch. Uh, I think they're good. I don't think they're top 10 quite yet. They need to do more to prove to me, but Jaden Daniels has been far better than I ever would have thought. Even Dan Quinn, far better than I would have thought as a head coach. Cliff Kingsbury, way better than I would have thought. Terry McLaurin's playing well. Zach Ertz is playing well. Luke McCaffrey's making plays. Austin Eckler looks better than I thought. The O-line looks better than I thought. So the commanders at number 11. Entering the top 10, the Atlanta Falcons at number 10. The Falcons are kind of odd. They, they remind me of a classic definition of of a one-dimensional playoff wild card team. This is like almost the definition of a wild card team, in my opinion. They've got some things that I really like about them. Their offense is a lot of fun, and they usually score a lot of points, 
and they're great in those high shootout games against bad defenses. Cousins can put the ball where he wants. He can control the offense. They've got balance on the ground with Bijan and Algier. Pitts is the invisible man. Darnell Mooney and Drake London are low-key, one of the best combos in football. But then again, their defense is pretty susceptible. They allow a lot of big chunks down the field, especially the middle of the field. They can be ran on at times, and they're just one-dimensional. They can win shootouts against mediocre to bad teams. It doesn't feel like they'll be able to punch above their weight and beat teams that are considered better. And I think part of that is because the defense isn't talented enough. I think part of that is on the coaching staff just being basic. I think part of that is Kirk Cousins is good, but not phenomenal. And he does have his flaws in terms of movement right now. But the defense, I think their run defense is better than their pass defense, but they're I mean, you can't let a team like Carolina hang around as long as they allowed. So at number 10, the Falcons. At number 9, the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, who is one of my favorite teams to watch on a weekly basis this year. I think Baker Mayfield has bar for bar, game for game, been the best quarterback in the NFL. Uh, Baker is throwing with touch, power, anticipation, and precision. He's making plays with his feet. He's making plays inside and outside the pocket. He's making a number of intermediate, powerful, middle of the field, in between the number throws. That is my favorite type of throw. High, hard to do and high uh, you know, level of difficulty. Uh, Baker is tough. He's a great leader. Chris Godwin looks as good as ever. Mike Evans still very, very good. Kate Otten making plays. They've got three running backs that can work for you. Rashad White, Bucky Irving, and now Sean Tucker. The O-line kind of gets better with every game. And they put up 51 and 600 on New Orleans in New Orleans, which is not an easy task. The week before, they played an Atlanta team that it felt like they outplayed them. They should have won. And honestly, they could easily only have one loss. So this team's very impressive. The defense, I still think, lacks a bit of a consistent pass rush. I think their secondary, specifically in the middle of the field, is a bit spotty. Antoine Winfield returned. Levante David is still there. Vita Vea and Kalaja Kansi are back together. Yaya Diaby can make plays. McCollum can make plays. But I feel like the depth of the corner position is a bit whack. Um, I think the Bucs are a team that I could see going to the divisional round, going to the NFC Championship. But it's hard for me to envision that they have the completeness of an offense-defense coach that I believe they can make the Super Bowl. But I think that they're a divisional round, maybe a sneaky candidate for the NFC Championship at number nine. At number eight, the Green Bay Packers, who are a better coach team than the than the Bucks. But I actually think the Packers, in a way, have less of a consistency. They're more of a high-end team with some low moments and some low points and some lack of consistency. But I thought their game against the Cardinals was the best game from start to finish that they played all year. I thought that the offense was explosive. Christian Watson for a big touchdown. Jaden Reed for a big touchdown. Romeo Dobbs with two touchdowns, I think. Jordan Love continues to throw a ton of touchdowns, four touchdowns in that game. Love was, I think, just better overall in that game. And the run game, I, again, I think it's been underwhelming. Packers fans seem to think Josh Jacobs is playing well. That's fine. I don't think he's playing bad, per se. I just feel like the run game's been better in past years. The defense is interesting because they've had their moments. They've had their games. They dominated the Cardinals for the most part, and they forced some turnovers. Um, I want to see them against the Texans. I want to see how that looks. I want to see how that feels. But this team feels like they could be ascending near the end of the year. And just as that playoffs is starting to get going, they're rolling and they're right where they were last year as a true Super Bowl contender. At number seven, the San Francisco 49ers. The 49ers, to me, could easily win the NFC this year, especially after Aiden Hutchinson got hurt. And I think ultimately, if I had to pick a team to win the NFC right now, I'd still pick the Niners. That being said, they do have some injuries still. Christian McCaffrey on offense. They could be trying to swap their center, Brendel, out for Feliciano, who could be returning soon. Hufonga's still out. Charvarius Ward missed the game against Seattle. Hargraves out. Greenlaw's out. They still got injuries. But the offense looks kind of back. 
The run game, really as good as any run game in football with all the different ways that Kyle calls his plays. The receiving core, I mean, Debo can kill you. Kittle can put two tutties on your head at any given moment. Ayuk can beat you down the field. Um, now we're going to get Ricky Pearsall in the mix. I'm really excited for Ricky to come back and, and see what he has at the NFL level. Brock Purdy is an MVP candidate. He's playing as well as any quarterback in the NFL. Uh, I definitely think he's taking another step forward. And the defense, I thought, was a lot better against the run against Seattle than past weeks. I also love the corner position for them right now. I think they're a little weak on their pass rush, but I feel like their corners right now, Green, the rookie, played amazing against Seattle. Ward can come back healthier. That would really help uh, uh, jolt them. And Lenore, I think, might be their best corner on their team. He's playing really good football. So San Fran, on paper, if they can get healthy, like I could see how they'd be better than last year because I think their defense was very shaky last year. Their run defense was very shaky. Their corners, there was clear weak links, Ambry Thomas. This year, it feels like if Hufanga comes back and Greenlaw comes back and maybe they make a move at the deadline to add a pass rusher or something potentially or even just a, a depth guy and they can get this green kid. They've also got Isaac Yadam who's making uh, their depth better, right? Like now they sign Adrian Amos, more depth at safety. It just feels like if this team can get back to where they were offensively with health last year, and this defense can be a tick better than last year, I think they're going to be better than last year by the time we get to like January. It might take a little bit of time. It's not there yet, but I can definitely see the vision for that. They've started slow, but I wouldn't expect that to take place the entire year. At number six, the Buffalo Bills, who very well could win the Super Bowl after they trade for Amari Cooper. The Amari Cooper edition, now sitting at four and two, has changed my mind on the Bills. The last couple of weeks, I was down on them. The first couple of weeks, I was high on them. I really liked how they played the first couple of weeks. I loved how they played against Jacksonville, obviously. Josh Allen was looking like the MVP. Then against the Ravens, down performance, especially for the defense, had me very discouraged. Against the Texans, Allen didn't play well. Now they play against the Jets. And the Jets, like I said, I don't think they're that bad. I think people are underrating them. And the defense was a bit spotty and a bit hit and miss, but they did make big plays in big moments. And Josh Allen was unreal in that game. One of the best quarterback performances of the week, if not the best. The O-line is good. The run game is legitimately good, considering they ran the ball with Ray Davis, Ty Johnson, without James Cook. They've got multi-tight end formations they can utilize. Now with Amari Cooper, they're going to have three receiver formations, a lot of diversity in their offense, a deep threat, a one-on-one -on -one threat with Amari Cooper on the outside, Khalil Shakir in the slot, Dalton Kincaid at tight end. This feels like a Super Bowl team for Josh Allen if they can somehow overcome their rival, the Chiefs, which I actually feel like they match up better with this year than last year. At number five, the Houston Texans, who could also be a Super Bowl threat. C.J. Stroud is playing, again, as well as any quarterback in football, especially in terms of accuracy and ball placement. Um, O-line is playing better and better. I thought they played well against Buffalo and even better against New England. Their run game. Huge boost from Joe Mixon and even a boost from Damian Pierce. They decided to trade Cam Akers. Stephon Diggs is playing really well. Tank Dell is now getting going. Dalton Schultz is a good player. And this offense with Nico Collins, once he comes back, it might be cooking to like a top three degree. The defense has an awesome pass rush. Will Anderson was a demon against Drake May. Three, uh, three sacks. Daniel Hunter had a forced fumble. They cause so much havoc up front. Danico Autry is coming back as Mario Edwards is getting suspended. Al Shair is an underrated element of their linebacking position. And I think their, their secondary is playing better than you would expect considering the injuries. They didn't have uh, Lassiter. They didn't have Jimmy Ward against the Patriots. But they'll get healthier. I wouldn't mind them making a trade in the secondary. At number four, the Detroit Lions, who could be going down on this list, but we'll see how it goes. I thought they played unreal against Dallas. I thought they ran the ball exceptionally well. They, they went to the plan and stuck with the plan that we thought they would have, which is run the ball, run it down their throat, be a, you know, be a bully. Jared Goff, when he's working off of that platform and when he's working off of the off-balance platform and he's working off of play action and he's able to hit those crossers and he's able to hit those quick slants and he's able to hit those uh, underneath drags and things like that and 
work off play action. He is one of the best quarterbacks in the league. He's perfect for this offense because he's a statue, but he's got a powerful arm. He hits everything in the middle of the field, and he's perfect with this landscape. Jamison Williams continues to impress me. Amon Ra has been a bit more quiet this year, but he's still very, very good. Can take over a game at any point. Montgomery's a grinder, a Gruden grinder. Love him. Uh, Jameer Gibbs is just explosive as hell. And this offense is as good as any in the league, especially in terms of tying it together, pass through the run game. Uh, man, they're good. They've, they've got everything. They've got trick plays. They've got screens. The defense does worry me against good opponents, against good passing games, against balanced opponents. Now I'm very worried with Aiden Hutchinson out. Like, I definitely feel like this team could still get to the NFC Championship again, even without Aiden Hutchinson. But with a full-strength Niner team, I wonder if they would have the pass rush to be able to affect Brock Purdy. I wonder how they would fare against the Packers uh, in a big playoff game, as I expect the Packers to ascend. I do wonder how the Vikings will match up with them this week. But the Lions were really impressive against Dallas. It's hard to really discount that. Dallas is not a great team, but man, Detroit maybe played their best defense of the year. Like, Carlton Davis was really good in that game, I thought. Uh, Arnold actually played a tick better than usual. Their safeties made some plays. <sighs> DJ Reader and McNeil, man. McNeil was a demon in that game against Dallas. Uh, but they've lost D linemen now, man. Kyle Pecco gets hurt too. Marcus Davenport gets hurt. They're going to have to make a move. They're going to have to make a splash if they want to get to that Super Bowl. At number three, the Baltimore Ravens, who move above the Lions, not because of record, but because of injury. Uh, the Ravens, Lamar is playing re really well. Again, guys, people are taking this as a slight, but. I've been saying Lamar is playing well and he's being productive, but he's not actually having to like carry the team, which is a positive. Like the, the, the positive is that Lamar is not having to overcome things around him. I actually felt like Zay Flowers had one of his best games of his career last week against the commanders. He was unreal, especially in the first half. Rashad Bateman played really well too and has been playing well for a couple weeks in a row. Mark Andrews sighting, okay. Uh, Derrick Henry is still playing like a king. And the play calling, man. The run game, the quick screens, the play action. You've got to give credit where credit is due. We've criticized the Ravens for play calling on offense, for syncing up the run in the pass, but the play action has been so deadly for them right now. Lamar is playing so well in terms of his outside-the-pocket throws, his extension of plays, and also even the play-action pass. So at number three, I've got the Ravens. The defense scares me in the secondary. They are giving up a lot of yards. I thought Daniels, things were too easy for him at times, but they just made enough stops to win that game. But against a better opponent in the playoffs, I'm worried. The pass rush is not bad, but it's not great. Linebacker is a bit susceptible outside of Roquan. And just the corners, man. The corners are just not playing as well. They're a little slow, it feels like. And I feel like they might need to make a switch at DC. That very well could be the play for them because defensive coordinator has not stepped up in place of Mike McDonald. The O-line continues to play well, but again, they've always been in spots where they can run the ball, play action. I do wonder about the O-line in more pass down situations, um, but you can't deny what they've been putting together and piecing together and tying together. The Ravens are looking very legit right now and very capable. Uh, so at number three, the Ravens. At number two, the Minnesota Vikings still undefeated. The Vikings, man, I've already said they had a bye, so there's not much to say. But I'm really in excited for this Lions matchup. I think that their receivers got an edge. If Darnold can hit it against man coverage, they should be good to go on offense. The Aaron Jones loss, I'm not sure how significant it is, how long it is. They add Cam Akers. I think that's significant. Without Aaron Jones, it takes away some explosion from the run game, explosion from the screen game to help out Sam Darnold, put them in bad situations occasionally where they weren't in previous weeks. And Aaron Jones was playing excellent football, but we knew he was going to get hurt. He always gets hurt. The O-line is good, and they're getting Dalton Reisner back. It should be even better. The defense is awesome. I think it's the best in football right now. And their run defense is solid. They're very, very, very dynamic, very creative. I can't wait for this Lions game. I'm very excited for it. At number one, the Chiefs.
The Chiefs have to be looking over their shoulder at what the Jets and the Bills have done in the trade market and wonder if they should acquire a receiver without Rasheed Rice because I do wonder if that's going to be their Achilles heel come big game time. I was baffled by the Saints' defensive performance and defensive game plan on Monday Night Football, and then we got to see them play the Bucs, which was even worse. So that might just be a Saints problem. I'm looking forward to seeing the Chiefs playing the Niners because I think the Niners are not a great defense, but they're pretty average, which makes it so that if the Chiefs are a good offense, they should put up points and move the ball. If they're an underwhelming offense, they probably will be stifled by the Niners, especially in San Francisco. So this is a huge matchup for them. I'm especially interested in seeing how Brock Purdy and Steve Spagnuolo go at it this time and if Shanahan has some answers for Spags. No Legereus need in this matchup now. Uh, I don't think Ricky will be out there maybe as much as the Niners would have liked when they saw this on their schedule because I think this is part of the reason they, they drafted him is to have another separator against man coverage. But the Chiefs' run defense has been a lot better than last year which I think really helps them in this matchup moving forward against San Fran because even without McCaffrey, the Niners are still really good at running the ball and it's still their bread and butter. So if Jordan Mason is out there, you know, they're still going to run a lot probably. So um, yeah, the Chiefs, good team, undefeated. I don't think they're dominant. I don't think they've really been dominant outside of the Saints game. Can they start to now beat teams that I would consider like the Niners, and then like convincingly, I want to see what their identity is, I should say, in these games. Is their identity defense? Is their identity, they're going to run the ball? Is their identity Mahomes? What is their identity in the Niners game? Because, you know, week one, it's the Ravens. The Ravens kind of had some things to figure out. It's week one. It's kind of, it's kind of fake. The Bengals, Very one-dimensional team. So when you look at their schedule so far, it's kind of like maybe they face these teams at the right time. With San Francisco, it's more of like, okay, the Niners aren't at full strength, but neither are the Chiefs. It's fairly even ground there. They're coming off a bye. What have they solved? What have they fixed? What do they have up their sleeve? And what is their identity for when they play these teams in the playoffs? Because I think this is a test for that. At number one, The Chiefs. There it is. My power rankings. Entering week seven of the 2024 NFL season. Hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, Gronk spike the like button and subscribe. It's Mitch. Deuces.